Hello, everyone. Today on the Far Navarra, I'm talking with Sam Stowall from CFRA Research. We'll get his take on this current environment, particularly the chances of us being in a recessionary period, what that might mean for forward-looking returns. The S&P, the major average, is pulling back mids and smalls down almost 2%. So we remain in this range around that 4125 sort of area. We rallied there about a week and a half ago, and now we're just sitting steady. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the final bar. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com in a cloudy Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the market close as we focus on the market environment and try to make sense of things using the Technical Analysis Toolkit, focusing on, on information embedded in price and breadth and sentiment. We'll touch on each of those in some way uh, on today's show. Uh, we have a segment later today called uh, Banking on Breadth, where we focus particularly on breadth conditions. And as you'll see, they've certainly come off as the market itself has, uh, has rallied off the previous lows, the S&P and the NASDAQ bouncing nicely. But from there, they've sort of stabilized. You really don't have, I would argue, a, a good sense of short-term direction. You had the initial push higher, and now we're sort of in that no man's land. A lot of breadth indicators in a similar no man's land uh, as well. We'll look at one particular breadth indicator, which just became overbought for the NASDAQ 100. I'll show you what it is and what it might mean for some short-term uh, pain in that area of the market. We have great guests on the show. We're so fortunate to bring people like Sam Stovall through and uh, talk about the market environment. So I look forward to chatting with him in just a bit. Tomorrow on June 9th, we have Pat Ceresna from Big Picture Trading coming on the show. Next week on Tuesday the 14th, Ms. Schneider uh, from Market Gauge in uh, New Mexico. And then on Wednesday the 15th, Dana Lyons from J. Lyons Fund Management coming with a money management perspective on what all we are seeing. Also wanted to let you know the next free webcast I will be giving with market misbehavior is coming up next Tuesday, June 14th, 1 o'clock p.m. Eastern. It is entitled The Market Bottom Checklist. The markets don't repeat themselves, but they often rhyme. What we'll do in our uh, in the webcast together is go through some of the previous market uh, bear market phases, look at the conditions going into the bottom, coming out of the bottom, compare that to what we're seeing right now, and develop a bit of a checklist to be looking for signs to make sense of when and uh, if and when a bottom is actually occurring. You could go to marketmisbehavior.com slash market bottom to sign up for that free event. Let's continue on with today's show, focusing on our market recap. As I mentioned, I think the main theme, particularly in the last week and a half in the short term, is this consolidation phase. Consolidation phase. You had this big run out of the lows for the S&P and the NASDAQ. We continue to chop around this same trading range. Let's look at the charts together and you'll see what I mean. The S&P rallied into yesterday's close coming off today. So again, just a, a give and take back and forth, buyers and sellers neck and neck, continuing to uh, sort of rotate the market right around 41.25 as a midpoint of the last uh, seven or eight trading sessions. The S&P today down to 41.15, that's down just over 1%. Mid caps and small caps down a little more with the mid cap index, the worst performer of the, uh, of the three. The VIX really essentially unchanged for the day, remaining around 24, which is relatively low compared to where we have been, uh, but, uh, but elevated uh, relative to some of the longer term history that we might be able to look at. Elsewhere, we have 10-year uh, yields, 30-year yields a bit higher. Dollar sign TNX is the ticker for the 10-year um, Treasury yield index from the CBOE. You can see it's up to around 303 at today's close after coming off yesterday back below 3%. It's really hovering around that. 3% level, a little higher on the uh, on the long bond yield. TLT, which is a bond ETF that we often track, is down about 0.9%. The dollar index up about a third of a percent from yesterday's close. Commodities mixed, to be honest with you, with gold flat for the day, silver in the negative. Um, the commodity complex overall using the DBC is higher because oil prices were uh, certainly pushing uh, pushing higher. The sector movements, once again, it's energy and then everything else. I feel like that has been a common way I've described the market environment for quite some time, but uh, continuing to play uh, play out that same thesis we've been describing. 
cryptocurrencies remain ex exceptionally volatile, to be honest with you. Yesterday, it felt like this was an, an all clear of sorts. And if that's what you were thinking, not the case, right? And, and cryptocurrencies, by their very definition, uh, since inception, have been marked by volatility, by sudden swings, by uh, excess movements, one side or the downside. Uh, you know, Bitcoin, Ether, those major coins, uh, I would describe as as uh, as volatile, as choppy, as consolidating, as sort of fluctuating around those key levels. For Bitcoin, it's around thirty thousand. For Ether, it's around eighteen hundred. They remain sort of overshooting and undershooting that general level, similar to the S and P. We're sort of in a uh, in a in a waiting period. And so you see what's next. I think I was talking about it on yesterday's show as we bring up the chart of the S and P 500 uh, here, the daily chart. Um, you know, I've often in this sort of environment refer back to John Bollinger and conversations I've had with him about you know volatility, expansions, and contractions. And I think using Bollinger bands, talking with uh, with John years ago, helped me think about that idea of thinking about volatility as an indication of as something that's cyclical, really. Right? You have these periods of uh, increasing volatility, volatility expansions as, as things get noisier. Then you have volatility contractions as things sort of come in, and markets tend to fluctuate. It turns to be that natural cycle between beside uh, around big moves and then sort of the recovery period. So the big move most recently was off of the lows around 38.10 um, to rally up to a 38.2 percent retracement of that March through May sell-off. From there, we've gone nowhere. We've gone we've gone places, but just sort of rotating around around 41.25. That's sort of a midpoint of that range. And we continue to have an up day, a down day, an up day, and a down day. At the end of the day, have we made any real directional progress? Absolutely not. So if that's the case, I tend to go to the much larger time period and think about the bigger picture trend. So I still see this market as a pattern of lower lows and lower highs. And at this point, certainly feels like we're making the next lower high before the next leg down. Now, I will stop saying that as the most absolutely obvious thing ever if we break out of this range to the upside. And that's why I think this sort of pattern is interesting. I've been asked what, what to call this pattern. It's not really a flag pattern because that would be a parallel sort of counter trend channel, lower highs, lower lows. Can't really call a pennant because that would be really a, a narrowing of the range and it's really remained stagnant. I guess I would call this sort of a rectangle pattern if I had to label it, but I'm much more, I'm less concerned with the labeling and more concerned with the reality of what this means. This means that last Friday was the end of that first leg and now we're sort of in a consolidation period, an equilibrium period. Buyers and sellers are in agreement. At one point, buyers take control or sellers take control. Or maybe to put it more accurately, buying, you know, um, buying power expands or selling pressure expands. One of those sort of becomes the overwhelming force that defines the trend. And you see which way we go from there. Um, at this point, again, if you ask me to, to say positive or negative, which way I would probably lean negative, just because of all the conditions that we've talked about leading up to the last six to eight weeks. I think there's still a lot of negativity in terms of breadth and sentiment and, and just general trend characteristics of a lot of, uh, a, a lot of names out there. Having said that, I have been wrong before, and I think getting out of this range to the upside would certainly clear the way to further upside, probably to 4,300, 4,320. That would take us back to late April, early May, and also the last Fibonacci retracement level, 50-day moving average, by the way, is at 4,225, which is kind of right in the middle there as well. Uh, yesterday on the show, we were talking with Larry Tentarelli about uh, you know just uh, general stock picking ideas, and he had two ideas: one in energy, one in materials. And uh, again, we talked about the strength in energy, this continued string of uh, positive trend, right? On an absolute basis, a lot of stocks making new highs and new lows. As I was scanning for new highs uh, for my market misbehavior premium members this morning, a lot of energy stocks out of about a hundred stocks in my large cap U.S. universe. I think probably a fifth of those were in energy, maybe even more, um, probably uh, you know, 20, 30% of those were in the energy space. And it's charts we talked about, things like DVN and Oxy and Valero and uh, Marathon and all these other ones, uh, you know, Chevron, uh, which is what one of the names we talked about uh, yesterday. So continued strength in energy, it's the, it's the uh, uptrend in oil prices, it's the you know, inflationary pressures, and then everything else below there. Real estate is a tough one because real estate is sort of a traditionally defensive sector, a higher yielding sector, more income oriented sector, um, you know, coming off uh, quite a bit today, uh, down over 2% uh, relative to, uh, to the markets themselves, the S&P down about uh, 1%. Just to finish off our market recap here, I just want to highlight a couple names of interest. The top performing name in the S&P, as I'm going through the data at the end of the, uh, of the day here, was LVS. Uh, Las Vegas Sands. Now, gambling was actually the number one Dow industry group out of 10506 of those that we track on uh, on stock charts, real time. And as I'm looking at this, you know, 
Encouraging that we're bouncing off of the lows? Absolutely. On a tactical time frame, are we making higher lows? Yes. We put in a low in May. We put in a higher low in late May. And from there, we've continued now to rotate above uh, the 50-day moving average. But has this trend really reversed itself? You know, I don't know yet. I, I don't think so. And, and again, the moving averages are slow, still sloping downwards. If you take a trend line using the previous highs, you know, we're not sort of anywhere near that point where it would be such a clear rotation of trend, right? And this could still be a rally phase within this downtrend, and this would make perfect sense, right? It still lines up with uh, with sort of the previous uh, uh, previous uh, bear market rallies that we've seen on charts like LVS. So a nice move higher in uh, in some of the gambling names. Uh, Win was another one I was looking at uh, a little bit earlier. Had they done enough to really change the character of the chart? Absolutely not, in my opinion. Have they done enough to tell you it's a short-term rally at least? Absolutely, right? And so I think Win is one regaining the 50-day moving average. Constructive charts first get to their 50-day, and then really constructive charts actually regain that. When I say regain it, I don't mean just trading above it or closing above it, like actually getting a valid follow-through, showing that there's demand beyond just that initial push higher. That's what you're looking for on uh, on something like Win or like LVS. The reason why is because this is what something like Royal Caribbean looked like before it rolled to new lows, right? You had this initial rally off of the lows. You're starting to think, okay, recovery, cruise lines are going to kill it again. And then, of course, that's before the next leg lower. So remember, think about the longer term time frame. Think about the trends that are leading up to the short term movements. And overall, hopefully, that helps keep you on the right side of things. We need to take a quick commercial break. We'll be back with today's guest, Sam Stovall. We'll see you in a minute. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to The Final Bar. This is Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. Thanks so much for joining us every weekday after the close as we break down the activity in the markets using the power of stock charts, using the technical analysis and the stock charts uh, capabilities to understand these markets and make sense of measures of price, breadth, and sentiment. I'm going to bring on Sam Stovall here in a few moments. But before I do, just a couple of quick announcements. First off, we welcome your questions. We'll do a mailbag segment at the end of the week on a Friday show. We had a great discussion on a Tuesday's show answering some of your questions. We'd love to feature your question live on the air. Our email is thefinalbar at stockcharts.com. We're on Twitter at FinalBarSCTV. We're on YouTube. Put our comment, put your comment below uh, the video you're watching on our Stock Charts YouTube channel. We'll gather all those questions. Hope to answer one of yours live on the air on Friday's show. Also, go to StockChartsTV.com. That is our on-demand platform. It is completely free. We have so much great expertise coming through Stock Charts TV. Uh, expert guests like uh, Stan Stovall, Larry Tentarelli, and many others. Special events like Larry Williams' uh, Market Outlook, which we just published the end of last week. Our special episodes of The Pitch, where different uh, market prognosticators will pitch you with, you, uh, pitch you with five ideas uh, for the current market environment, all for free at StockChartsTV.com or on your mobile device, just search for Stock Charts TV on demand. I want to welcome on today's guest, Sam Stovall. Sam's the chief strategist at CFR Re A Research, coming to us from the Northeast. Sam, it's great to see you. Welcome back to the show. Hey, Dave. Good to be on again. It's a pleasure, as always. Uh, help us make sense of this environment. I know, I know a lot of people are struggling. We've had sort of a big move off of the lows, but overall, there seem to be a lot of uh, sort of storm clouds still over the market. How are you seeing this current environment? Well, right now, uh, I think that we are in a relief rally mode, uh, as you've been talking about for the last several weeks or so. We were as high as 7% plus above the uh, May 19th low for the S&P, which was off 18.7% from the January 3rd high. Um, but now that gain seems to be whittling a bit. And as you showed uh, in the preamble, you know, it's just sort of marking time, probably before we get the CPI number on Friday. And I think that number could actually trigger a move one way or the other. Inflation has certainly been a concern for a lot of investors. You have the dreaded R word on your first chart. Talk us through what this is telling you about the conditions here. Well, Dave, this chart shows the undulating line is the year-on-year -year percent change in headline CPI going back to inception in the late 1940s. 
Um, along with that, I show um, average one standard deviation above and below, as well as two standard deviations above and below. I then overlay that with blue, that is for bear markets, and then orange for recession. And what this chart essentially shows is that the five times since the late 40s in which we touched one standard deviation or six and a half percent or higher, we ended up being met with not only a recession, but also a bear market. So chances are, obviously no guarantee that with inflation now recently peaking at eight and a half percent and likely to remain above eight percent with Friday's reading, and we think stubbornly at about six and a half percent by the end of this year, uh, history would indicate that a recession is a very high likelihood. Your second chart is telling us a little bit about what to expect if if uh, if a recession would come on. Talk us through this one if you could. Well, the uh, the numbers at the top uh, show bear markets with recessions, and these are S and P five hundred bear markets since the late nineteen forties, and then the three bear markets without recessions. And in terms of months, it basically says that bear markets that are accompanied by recessions last longer than bear markets that are not accompanied by recession. So like 1987, yes, we did have higher interest rates. Uh, we fell 34%. Uh, however, it was uh, done in three months, very short, uh, because we did not have a recession to go along with it. Probably of importance also is that far right-hand column, which shows what kind of multiple contraction have we experienced during these bear markets. So what was the, the peak at the most recent quarter, what was the trough at the, the uh, most current quarter, um, and then basically seeing about a 32% contraction would imply that since we ended last year at about 20, a PE of about 23, that we could end up with a PE of around 15, provided we don't have additional earnings uh, downside revisions. So that would point to about 3,400, 3,500 on the S&P 500. But obviously that could change if the earnings estimates come down. Yeah, and you had a big if. That's assuming there's, a, there's not the estimates coming down. Talk us through the third chart here. It's, it's very, very helpful, I think, to illustrate that. Well, the third chart shows that already we've started to see downward earnings revisions. Uh, this is what is the percent change in estimated Q2 earnings uh, versus what the estimates were as of March 31st. Uh, and you can see that it's the inflation hedge sectors on the far left, energy and materials, and to a lesser extent, industrials, that have actually seen increases to their second quarter earnings. The S&P 500 itself down about a, a little less than one and a half percent, but uh, not surprisingly, consumer discretionary taking it on the chin with the commentary from Target twice uh, about concerns with inventories, profit margins, et cetera. So, I guess the real question is, is that all there is, as Peggy Lee once sang, or is there more to go? And it's obviously, I mean, I think the market's been weighing heavily in the in the consumer space, given, you know, given all it's sort of a, a recognition that you're seeing baked into the estimates of, of the impact of inflation. We just have a minute left, Sam, and I'd love to just ask you about the energy sector. I, you know, earlier this week we were talking about just this uptrend that continues and continues. And would you be concerned about that? How do you go? You know, it, it's a very bifurcated market in a lot of ways. We have something that's working so well while other sectors are struggling. Talk us through how you would approach a sector like energy here. Well, there are two ways you could approach it. If you simply at the end of every month, look back 200 days and say, I'm going to own the four best performing sectors. And then every month reevaluate. Well, energy is still tops among that list. So as you talked about in a previous uh, webinar, let your winners ride. However, if you are looking at a relative basis, um, energy is so high at this point, it reminds me of the old Milwaukee beer commercial tagline, it just doesn't get any better than this. So uh, maybe the angle of ascent comes down and it stays positive, uh, but certainly the relative outperformance, I think, will begin to wane. That's a great take, Sam. Listen, it's such a pleasure to talk with you. You always bring some really thought-provoking uh, charts and uh, concepts along with you. Stay safe there in, uh, in Eastern PA, and we'll talk to you again soon. Thanks again, Dave. That's Sam Stovall. Sam's the chief strategist at CFRA Research. Uh, and, and again, I, just, I love that, that just illustration of uh, where we are at, just the prospect of recessionary period. And what I, what I love about his second chart, which I thought was really interesting, was just thinking about 
how long bear markets actually uh, last. It is so funny to me. I feel like November, December, January, February, at some point along that way, you probably recognize, regardless of what toolkit you're using, that things were going from very good to somewhat questionable, right? As things started to struggle. I had people immediately asking me when the bear market was going to be over, if it was. And I'm thinking, if this is actually a bear market, th then chances are this goes a lot longer than that. I, I think one of the biggest takeaways I've had from my limited career in the financial industry is uh, going back to 2000 is that bear markets last way longer than you usually want them to, particularly secular bear markets, which I don't think we're in, but uh, but certainly can be uh, can be a painful stretch. Great take there, uh, as always, from Sam Stovall, CFRA Research. Let's continue on today's show. Our next segment is called Banking on Breadth. What we love to do is check in on some of the breadth indicators and uh, and see what they can tell us. We often refer to market breadth uh, on the show. And, and again, I, I tend to think of market analysis, top-down analysis in three phases. It's price, most important, right? Most important, if you know nothing else, look at a chart of the asset or the S&P or gold or whatever you're looking at. Secondary to that would be breadth conditions, particularly with equity indexes. What about the stocks that comprise those indexes? Because a lot of times the individual names will start to rotate, will start to change their character before it's reflected in the major averages. The third piece of that is sentiment. And uh, usually on Thursday's show, we'll go through some of the sentiment indicators, things like the VIX and survey data and so forth. So when I look at, <clears throat> excuse me, when I look at breadth indicators here, our first chart is looking at the cumulative advanced decline line. So every day, how many stocks are closing higher and lower in each of these four different buckets of names? And then you take a cumulative measure of that and sort of track those uh, that data over time. And you have what's called the cumulative advanced decline line. More often than not, the market trend and the advanced decline lines will continue to sort of move in the same direction, right? Makes sense that in an uptrend, more stocks are closing higher than lower and the opposite in the downtrend. But what's funny is that market turning points that starts to not happen. You'll get some disagreement. When I look at these four, you can see my very subjective color coding system has them all sort of a neutral amber color. All four of these, actually most of these had been red, particularly when they failed to make a new high in uh, in March. And that was after making lower highs in, uh, in January. But you'll notice that a couple of these actually made a higher high in January. This is when I started color coding these guys sort of orange, the small cap breadth and the New York Stock Exchange breadth. From there, most of them turned red in April into May as they made a new low. But again, the large cap breadth was sort of the outlier. It did not make a new low uh, March into uh, May. At this point, they're all sort of within this range from the low in May to the high in, uh, in April and or uh, late March. Until you start seeing these uh, advanced decline lines get above, uh, above their previous swing highs, I think overall they're uh, they're neutral. They start making a new low, and I would color the code them back to negative. The fact that all four of them are back above the 50-day moving average means at the very worst they're neutral at this point. And I think the neutral nature of this chart reflects the neutral nature of what we see with the markets as a whole right now. Um, advancers, decliners overall, it's been fairly choppy. It's worth noting here that in late May you had this run of days where a lot of uh, a lot of stocks closing higher than lower. This is sort of breaking down the individual days. That comprises cumulative advanced decline line. So the trend is what's most important, but it's always looked as interesting to see if you have these outlier days. Some of those days where sort of everything's up or everything's down, because a lot of times that can tell you about the conditions. Look at how uh, this was such a um, one directional uh, market uh, from mid uh, mid May to uh, late May. That that run higher that we talked about in our market recap, and then look at how things have consolidated from there. Those days, it was about 75, 85% of, uh, of uh, New York Stock Exchange listings, all positive uh, days, which is pretty high. That's some of the higher, uh, highest levels you, you'll ever see uh, in that indicator. From there, it stabilized a little bit and you start to see more and more days with a lot of distribution. Those are these big down days that you're seeing during this sideways trend. So again, what you're seeing is an equal balance of up days and down days as we have this choppy sideways environment for the overall uh, markets. This was a chart that we highlighted, I think yesterday is one of our three and three charts is the percent of stocks above uh, some key moving averages. Uh, as of right now, we have 35% of S&P members above their 200 day, only 37% of S&P members above their 50 day. It was almost to 50% as of yesterday's close. Today, giving back some of those uh, gains from yesterday and the indicators going back down to sort of the, uh, the mid thirties. I have a pink horizontal line on both of these indicators right at 50%. And, and the reason is this, 
in general, when these indicators are below 50%, it's telling you there's more distribution uh, in the market because most stocks are below their 50-day moving average. They get back above 50%. That tells you things are starting to uh, improve a little bit. Back in March, when we were looking at this most recent rally versus the rally we had in March, in March, this indicator got to over 70%, over 70% of S&P names above their 50-day uh, moving average. Most recently, we got up to less than 50%. So even though there's been a nice run higher, it's not as broad as you saw back in, uh, in March, which means this rally here is looking a lot more like the rally from late January, which is sort of like the big move down, an initial recovery, and then we sort of rotate lower. And, and that may be what we're seeing now if, of course, if we see the price uh, confirm that by making a, uh, a new swing low. Bullish percent indexes, just very briefly here to finish off the uh, the segment for the S&P 500, it's around 62, 63%. It's kind of healthy. That's not uh, overly bullish, but not bearish by any stretch of the imagination. But this is one I wanted to hit on just very quickly. The NASDAQ 100, just around 70% of the members of the NASDAQ 100 above their uh, um, uh, sorry, in a bullish phase using the, their point and figure charts. If you look at the last one, two, three times that has happened when we've gotten above 70% and come back down, that has been the beginning of the next leg lower. In the last week, we got above 70% on this rally as a lot of sort of tech uh, sort of names uh, bounce very quickly enough to register a buy signal on the point and figure chart. It just dipped below 70% uh, earlier this week. This might be something to watch because what that, that might indicate is that the rally, there's been enough of a bounce, enough stocks sort of turning into a, uh, a positive sign. We remain below 70%. That tells you that this uptrend is sort of faltering and that individual names are struggling to maintain that recovery move. We need to wrap the show, folks, and go to the three and three. Let's hit on three charts that tell the story of this market in just under three minutes. Chart number one, in our last segment, Banking on Breath, we focused on this indicator along with other measures of breath. I think breath Measures are so helpful for making sense of the market environment, not just price, not just the, the values of the indexes, but the individual stocks that comprise those indexes. Just over 70% of NASDAQ 100 names uh, were uh, in a bullish point figure chart. Uh, and that's after less than 15%, just about a month ago, right? Mid-May, it was down to uh, almost single digits. Now, all of a sudden, it's up to 70%. The last couple of times we've gotten above 70% and dipped back below, that's been the, be been the beginning of the next big leg downwards. That's why it might be an interesting chart to watch through the remainder of this week into, uh, into next week. Chart number two, Royal Caribbean. You know, We talked about some names that had rallied a little bit, but how do you differentiate a short-term rally versus you know, just a, uh, you know, a, a bigger recovery, right? Where it tells you that things are starting to sputter out a little bit. I think the chart of RCL is a great cautionary tale of getting too excited about initial rallies, sort of those uh, bear market rallies that happen when the overall trend is lower and you get those bounces off the lows. When a stock becomes oversold, when there's so much downward pressure that, uh, that it moves downward so quickly, at some point, shorts are willing to cover those and take profits. People are willing to buy in on a lower valuation and at the very least, they uh, do a tradable move to the upside. What does not have or what, what you're looking for is something that turns into something more meaningful. And that's when you put in a higher low. That's when you start to see improvement in breadth condition or momentum indications uh, that suggest that this is uh, the beginning of something a little more strong and a little more meaningful. The chart of RCL shows you that even in a strong downturn, you're going to have those quick bounces. Those are whipsaws more than anything. And you want to wait for something to establish itself a little better. An indicator like MACD or PPO can often be helpful to try to uh, differentiate between those two, by the way. Finally, LVS, number one stock in the S&P as I was screening through names uh, earlier today. Gambling was the number one uh, industry group out of over 100 that we track. The chart of LVS is interesting. Just a simple trend line analysis, taking the high from February, high from April. You can see we broke above that trend line, retested it from above, and now uh, continuing to push to the upside. So now what? We can draw a trend line using the lows in uh, mid-May, lows in late May. Do we remain above that trend line? Trend lines can be really helpful. It's just a visual gauge of how something is going. Are things overall trending higher or lower? Use the recent lows in an uptrend. If and when we would break that purple trend line to the downside, that would certainly be a potential cause for concern. That's a wrap for this show. I want to thank you so much for joining us every weekday after the close for the final bar. Special thank you to Sam Stovall joining us uh, from Pennsylvania from CFRA Research. All of our previous interviews and uh, episodes can be found at StockChartsTV.com. For StockCharts.com in Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be safe. Have a great night. 
Hey, Grayson Rhodes here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below. Maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're gonna bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.